Nice to be here this morning, and now I believe we're going to have a special, Brother Williams, to tell me by someone from his church. Yes, yeah, Donna Reed. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, drop from my way. That never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Oh, my brother, if the things this world gave you leaves a hunger that won't pass away, my blessing. what we're here for this morning, raising up our cups, fill it, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This is the only time that we'll have the opportunity to ask this. There'll come a time where we'll be on the other side, and then we won't have that opportunity. So while we do have it, and in our right mind, I think one of the most sensible things that anyone can do while God has given us the opportunity to do so, is to do it. Get our cups filled now with his love and mercy. There is one who sat with us long ago, not too long ago, neither. And he's passed on. And it's a great sorrow in our hearts for Brother Williams. Brother Williams, our chapter president here, his father. How old was your father, Brother Williams? Eighty-eight. Eighty-eight. That would be about 18 years, I guess, have passed the, the uh, no, it would be, uh, yeah, 18 years have passed the promised time. A gallant man, it hasn't been too long ago since sitting in the meeting, I said to him, in no disregards to Brother Williams, I said, you look younger than your son. Carl, it just goes to show that we're here today and tomorrow we're not here. We don't know when that time comes, when it is coming, but we know it's coming. I was thinking, but life is a great thing. It's, life is an opportunity. 
we just had a great tragedy of one that come to our church so long from Chicago, was killed the other day coming home. A mother, she's close, to, I guess, close to 70, and she and her husband riding along and up Kansas or Missouri, one, a blizzard going through, a man driving, car out of control. Uh, her neck was broke instantly. And we just don't know when this is coming. When I, they called me to tell me about it, and I called up all the children around across the nation, telling them, of course, being their pastor-like, I was one to notify them, uh, thinking of how quick we can go. And then there sat a box of candy sitting before me that she made me about a week ago and gave to me, just to see how quick we can be snapped out. But if, that, if this life only was where we had our hopes, we'd be a miserable people. Job said in the 14th chapter, Oh, that thou would hide me in the grave and keep me in the secret place. Have you ever noticed how nature testifies of God? We find the trees, the leaves go off the trees, and the life in the tree goes down into the ground like the grave and stays there until the wrath of the winter is past. Then it comes back again, bringing forth new life. It's a testimony that we live again. The sun rises of the morning, just a little baby, it's weak. After a while, it's, this time it's in school, high school. Then at noon, it's in its strength. Then the afternoon, it begins to turn to the other side. Then in the evening, it gets weak again and dies. But that's not the end of the sun. It comes up again the next morning to testify to another generation that there is a life, death, burial, and resurrection. Even nature everywhere speaks of him. And nature... It's a great testimony in another way, that is, that we cannot have this resurrection life unless it serves God's purpose. Now, if a seed is planted and that seed is germatized, it brings forth a new flower. But if it isn't germatized, it will not bring forth a new flower if it doesn't serve God's purpose. Not just because it's a flower it rises, because it serves God's purpose. That's the reason the sun rises, because it serves God's purpose. And we rise when we serve God's purpose. I believe that Brother Williams served God's purpose in life. A real father. And I see his darling companion, Mrs. Williams, sitting here. A real husband. That's one of God's purposes. A father. One of God's purposes. And he was germatized to God by the Holy Spirit. God's main purpose. So to say that Brother Williams will not rise and be with us again, we'd have to say there's no, there's no going down to the sap. There's no rising of the sun. Everything speaks of his resurrection again, to be with us again. Everything. First, the sun, the flowers, the nature, botany life. Everything speaks of it. And then the Word of God speaks for him. And besides that, the very faith that's in our heart pulsates that we'll see him again. God rest his soul. Just as a little salute to him that once sat with us, let us stand to our feet just a moment. Heavenly Father, we have never tried to make a gathering like this a purpose just to be seen or heard. We have come together each time for the edification of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and to give testimony to those who are without him that they might find him. We are, our hearts are burden for those who are left behind from the departing of our brother, one that sat with us not long ago, as many times sat right in this same chapter. But we believe that you let him live out a good full round life, and his soul is with you today. Rest him, O oh God, until that day when we shall see him again. Bless his son here, his other children, his darling wife, those who love him, and that's all of us, Father. And may we take notice to this, that we too are frail, and we must go someday. So let us prepare ourselves for that great hour. And if there should be some here this morning who has not prepared for this same event, may this be the day that they'll say yes to the Lord Jesus, and also be germatized to him by the Holy Spirit. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Now, we want to announce a, a few announcements. My wife, 
was sitting back there this morning, I told her, I said, Honey, I'm going to be out of the breakfast. We had to go downtown and do some things. And I said, I'm going to be out at 10 o'clock. She looked at me. I said, If I'm not out by 10 o'clock, I'll buy you three new dresses of your choice. So I, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> I owe three dresses right now because it's 20 till 10 now. But I will try to hurry as quick as possible. We're glad to be here in Jericho with you, brethren, this morning. And we invite you Monday night up to Jerusalem, to Tucson, to, at the banquet down there. See, Phoenix is in the valley, like Jericho, Tucson, where I live, is on the mountain. That's, that's Jerusalem. Where are you at, Tony? Won't somebody say amen around here? <laughs> now I'm in a trap. Tony didn't even show up. <laughs> well, tomorrow or Monday night is the banquet at um, at Tucson, and we certainly would be glad if you're around that way. Would drop in and see us. My subject that night, if the Lord willing, is we have seen His star in the east and have come to worship Him. And uh, now, the 19th of this month. Uh, or ne- next month, rather, 19th of, fe- of January, I start a revival here right in this room, the Ramada Inn here. And the 19th, the 20th, and 21st, and then the 22nd, I believe, starts the 23rd. 23rd. I have four nights here. And um, as a revival. Many of you minister brothers, we're certainly happy to have you with us this morning, and we cordially invite you out to bring your people, uh, the ones especially that's you know, here in the city that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior. And then, secondarily, to those who are sick and, and believes that God answers prayer, we aim to pray for the sick during this time, just prior to the great national convention. It's to be held here beginning the 22nd. And I'm sure you want to hear that because there's many outstanding speakers come, and I'm sure you have a great time. Now, this morning, I have... Um, thought about speaking here to this chapter, which Phoenix has always been a place on my heart. I like Phoenix. I was here when I was a little boy out here at Wickingburg, just above, and lived down here at 16th and Henshaw. It was a desert then. But I see it's right in the metropolitan, well, really in the heart of the city. It goes to show that there's a changing time, changing. But there's one thing I want to speak on this morning is the unchanging one, that's God. God in His program, His Word, it never changes. Times change, man's change, systems change, but God never changes. He ever remains the same. Now, I thought being that we were facing the Christmas time, that we would uh, maybe uh, speak on uh, a Christmas message. And now, if you have your Bibles and like to read, sometimes people do behind uh, evangelists or speaker. I want to read from St. Matthew's Gospel, the second chapter, or a portion of the Word. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded them where Christ should be born. They said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets. And thou, Bethlehem, of the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, but out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. And now, with some notes here and some scriptures to refer to, I'd like to have your undivided attention for a little while on the subject of why little Bethlehem. You know, at Christmas, I think we all, too many of us, I wouldn't say all, but too many of us lose the real value of what Christmas is. As I notice out here, even the palm trees are decorated, and in the east it's always the fir tree or the evergreen. And months or weeks, rather, maybe a month or six weeks before Christmas ever begins, it's always a tinsel and, and a great—they've made it a commercial. And instead of 
what it really means. I don't believe that Christ is born on the 25th day of December. Uh, I do not believe that at all. It would be impossible for the things to happen. The hills of Judea are snore than while the snow is waist deep in there in the month of, of December up in Judea. But we realize in studying history, uh, Christ was probably born in the spring, along maybe April, May, somewhere like that. But when it was changed, this they brought it when Christianity was converted into Romanism. They made the sun God's birthday, which was at the solar at the 25th from the 21st uh, to the 25th of December. The sun setting right almost hardly changes at all. And then that was the sun God's birthday, so they changed it to the son of God. But remember, whatever what day it might be. We still doesn't take away the sacredness of what it's supposed to be. Where Satan has robbed us of this is made a great commercial, and Santa Claus stole all of the worship. It's become a, a day like Easter, like uh, bunny rabbits and pink ducks, and and what's that got to do with Easter? What's that got to do with the resurrection of Christ? It's just like the world today. They, the kids on the street can tell you more about. Davy Crockett than he could about Jesus Christ. They can tell you more about some uh, uh, outlaw, some criminal of days gone by than the can, the prince of life that uh, that was born uh, 1,900 years ago. But that doesn't take the real thing away from we Christians. You see, always light shines its best in the darkness. The forked lightning in the black, cloudy skies at night shows. There can be light and darkness. And when the light is shining, you don't see. Uh, if the sun's shining, you don't need the lights too much. But darker, the smaller the light, greater it will shine in the darkness. Darker the better. It shows itself better. And that's more or less that we Christians ought to be testifying to the glory of God giving His Son to us. This Christmas ought to be an outstanding thing. We Christians, ought, no matter how much it looks, it'll make it shine that much better. The whole world's got tinsel. We've got Christ. And that's what we ought to be letting shine in this dark hour that we're now living in. We think of how God does things in unusual ways because He is unusual Himself. God is unusual. He's, he's the supernatural, the infinite, until we finite. So anything He does is, in His scope, unusual. And God is so... So great till he takes the unidentified things of the earth to identify himself by it. We notice here in my subject of why a little Bethlehem, that smallest of all of Judea, the princes of the other cities of Judea, why did God choose to send his son to that place? That's what we want to talk on. God taking the things of the world, I believe the scripture says, by the foolishness of preaching, it pleased God. To take the unidentified things, what we make great, God calls foolish. What we put so much glory to, God says it's, it's, it's no good. And what we think is no good, God glorifies it. I was thinking of just before the birth of our Lord, when all the prophets and so forth that spoke of the forerunner coming, however a mountain would be brought low and the low places brought high and the mountains would skip like little rams and the leaves would clap their hands. And it was a a minister, a prophet by the name of John, came forth out of the wilderness, not from even a theological school, whiskers all over his face and a piece of sheepskin, not in a clergy clothes, come out and announce the kingdom of God is at hand. And the people could hardly understand such an outfit as that coming with no identification of any, any system, anything that he belonged to, any fellowship card or any denomination that he was backing him up. The message was too great. He couldn't take man. God schooled him out in the wilderness. His message was not on some kind of a, a theological terms. He spoke of serpents and axes and trees, and that's what he was used to. Nature, watching it, how it worked. And that was the, uh, the way he approached, not as a clergyman, but as, as a man of nature. And... Uh, the people could hardly understand. He didn't even have a pulpit. Probably wasn't welcome in any. But he preached on the banks of the Jordan, probably standing in mud and up 
half to his knees. But the people come out to hear it, those who were honest in heart. They wanted to hear because it was something different. It had a ring of truth to it. Today we ought to be at just at the approaching of the birth of Christ. Our message, it ought to have a ring of truth to it that would make people thirst to find him. God took that simple man without education, not one day in school, and yet said he was the greatest among all the prophets that ever lived. Because God identifies himself in unidentified things. When Jesus chose his disciples, it was there were many men better qualified for the job than those disciples. They were clergymen. He never called one. They were clergymen in them days, great men, priests, man of education, renowned man, but he never called him. He took fishermen and tax collectors and so forth to, to send his message out. He always does that. In the days of Noah, he chose a farmer, just a common farmer, to announce the destruction of that age. Just a common farmer, not a clergyman. Just a farmer. In the days of Noah, he took a, a, a pardon me, in the days of Moses, he took a runaway slave, not a clergyman, and he let him get out till he was satisfied out in the backside of the desert and lose his education and appeared to him in a burning bush and sent him down with a crooked stick in his hand to take over a nation that had that he'd run from. See, God takes the simple things to identify himself through. See, he'd taken his, it's just his word. He made the world out of the things that, that does, has not appeared. A few days ago, I was at the Mars Auditorium, one of our great New York campaigns, and I was hearing a lecture on Einstein speaking of this galaxy that said take 150 million years of, of light time to go out to it and 150 million years to get back. And then just think 150 million light years. That would be 300 million light years. And then when you got back here, you'd only been gone 50 years. Think well, how fast light travels, 86,000 miles per minute, and think of how many billions uh, and trillions of years it would take to go out there and come back 120, uh, 300 million light years. And that's just to a galaxy in the constellation that God just blew from his hands and he may be aeons of time in light years beyond that. And they're looking down upon that. And then this uh, Russian said that he's about 150, 200 miles up in the air, said he never seen no God or angels. How simple can man get? And then think of all them billions and trillions of years and only 50 years from here, what did he do? Broke into eternity. They say this astronaut that just went up, was up so many hours, went so many 17 times around the world or whatever it was, they said it, never even, it wasn't one second in his life. He was traveling with the time. So you see, you break into eternity. That's the greatness of God. Some, our minds cannot fathom how great he is. And yet, when he gets ready to reveal himself, he makes it so simple. It takes the simple things to do it. The simplicity of it. David. You seem to be the, uh, all of Jesse's seven sons. He was the last one to be brought before the prophet. Well, even his own folks could have uh, laughed. They couldn't imagine a little ruddy-looking David, a little stoop-shouldered, ruddy-looking man to be the man that would be the king of Israel. He might not look like a king to those people, but he sure must have looked like it to God because he, he anointed him king anyhow. See, he took the simple of David's family, or Jesse's family, to, uh, to make king, something that the world had turned down, uh, the, he turn, sent him back to take care of the sheep. He brought forth his, forth his first son, a great, strong, stately-looking man, probably could stand erect and look like a king of Israel. And that's the one they thought would look good with the crown on his head. That's the one would wear the, the kingly garment and could... Pack the staff and whatever must be done to a king. He, he looked good to the eyes of the people. But the prophet, with anointing oil in his hand, said, Haven't you got another one? 
And he brought them one by one until finally he said, have you got another one? He said, I've got one, but perhaps he wouldn't be nothing. He's just a little dried up sort of a fellow. We got him out there herding sheep. He said, go get him. And as soon as he fell in the eyes of the anointed prophet, he poured the oil upon his hand, head, and run to meet him. He said, this is the one God chose. See, it's not tinsel always of the world. It's God's choosing. By grace, he chose us. So we're grateful for that this morning. And it doesn't take those great tinsel things of the world. The humblest can be a servant of Christ. Take somebody who's willing. God anointed him. So he takes the little things. Now, why did he take little Bethlehem? Seemed like there would have been greater places that the king, great king of kings could have been born. Usually when we fix up an event here on earth, we try to get it the highest most glittering thing that we can think of. We take it to the biggest places and spend the most money and the most elaborate things. That's the way we do it. But God don't do it that way. He takes something that's nothing so he can show himself to be mighty. That he can, if he had took a high priest or a well-trained man in the days when he's calling the apostles, if he had took that instead of an ignorant, unlearned fisherman who couldn't even write his own name, they could have said, oh, that, see, your education pays off. But God took a man who couldn't even write his name. That he could take something he could get in his hand. Something that he can make something out of to show that he's God. We get to a place that we realize that we're nothing. Then get in God's hands and he can mold you and make you the way he wants you to be. But as long as we feel that we're important, then you'll never get nowhere. You can't even get in the hands of God. Until we realize that we're not important. One of my little girls was asking me the other day about importance. I said, well, uh, talk about some important man. Well, it was a president. It was just assassinated. And our hearts is grieved over it. And I said, well, he was an important man. The papers played it up. The television shot it. Billions and billions of dollars it cost the government to broadcast that. Which, that's all right. That's their business. But I said, this little Pentecostal preacher up there in Kalina... A man walked in, a drunk with a shotgun, called for his wife and shot the man plumb out of the pulpit and then shot his wife and shot himself. A little piece in the back of the paper about that being. Let me tell you, brother, no matter who we are, if you want to know how important you are, I said to my little girl, stick your finger in a bucket of water and pull it out and try to find the hole. We are nothing. There's only one important. That's God. We must remember He's the one. Look like it. If they wanted to, man had been fixing a place for the king to be born, there was more greater religious places and historical places for the king instead of this little Bethlehem. Places, for instance, like Shiloh. Shiloh is where the ark was pitched first. We know as we come across, we're, come across the Jordan to this side in Palestine, and where the ark was set up for its first worship place. Or Gilgal, Zion. Zion, a great place. Gilgal also. Or the proud, great capital of Jerusalem. Where the heads of all the organizations gathered at their headquarters. Looked like they'd have fixed a place up there at Jerusalem for the great king to be born. If they wanted a place, a historical place, or a great outstanding place, that's where the religious headquarters was of their religion. To which the king came to. He came to represent their religion. And he, and when he did, instead of them fixing him a place at Jerusalem or one of those great historical spots, he was born in Bethlehem, the smallest of all the cities. Art thou not the least among the princes of Judea? But out of thee shall come a, a governor that shall rule my people. And this great proud Jerusalem and all the other cities was rejected. Or maybe they could have took some of the places of refuge, the great place like Hebron, Kadesh, or Ramoth Gilead, one of those great refuge cities, because he was to be our refuge. If we had tried to fix it in our own mind, we might have took, say, well, now if this great king's coming, which will be our refuge, he should be born in one of these great memorial places of a refuge like uh, Ramoth Gilead or Kadesh or, or one of those. We would have tried to fix it like that in our minds. 
But you see, God has other ways of doing things. He knows how to do things right. Now, by the mind of God and the help of God, we'll try to say why did this happen. Because everything works just exactly right in God's great program. And I want you people here at Phoenix and around to, to, to try to get this. That remember that God knows what he's doing. And he takes simple means to do it by. Because if he does something by some great outstanding something, then God never does do things like that. He never did in all the history of the Bible. God never did deal, never did in any time take any group of people to do anything. God takes an individual. You're the one. You, one person. God never changes his program because his first program, he must always remain with that program. In the days of Noah, he had one man, Noah. The days that he brought Israel out, he had one man. That was Moses. We know that Dathan and many of the others tried to think, well, they had the same authority and so forth. And you know what happened to them? The days of the coming of the Lord, the days of uh, John the Baptist and the different ones, he has one individual he works with. And he deals with us today as one individual, not as a group, one person. It's going to be up to you and I how we stand before God because he's dealing with you and I as individuals, not as a group that we're in and not at the, uh, the denomination church we belong to, but as you and I as individuals. Now, Joshua, in dividing up the land, give this little spot to Judah. Many of you, uh, I got some places here jotted down to where... It sets that, but we're all aware of that, where it sets up in the corner. And it was just a little place that they give it to Joshua in dividing the land, give that to the tribe of Judah. And now, when Israel come over the river of Jordan, now try to catch this. When Israel crossed over into the land, the promised land, there was a Gentile woman that we know as Rahab the harlot. And she asked for mercy. And she received mercy. She received mercy as long as she stayed under that scarlet card. And uh, that's the only way she could have mercy. It was a sign, a token that was given her. We have a token today also. And we're safe as long as we stay under our scarlet card, the blood of Jesus Christ. As an individual, not a group, an individual. We each must stay under that scarlet card of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then this Rahab, after she was spared, she got all of her people in. Everything that was under the card was, was saved, just like when God in e Egypt, when all was under the blood was saved. All was under the scarlet card was saved. All under the blood of Jesus is saved. All out from under it is lost. And it's ready for destruction. And we find out, now in doing this, then we understand by history that she courted some general, I don't know his name right now, in Israel's army. And she finally married this man. And they settled up here in this, near this little place. And her son, Solomon, was the one who founded Bethlehem. See, a Gentile is connected with it to begin with. A Gentile. Rahab the harlot. Now, we find out that Solomon founded this little city of Bethlehem, and he begot got Boaz. And Boaz was the one who married Ruth, another Gentile. And we're following this lineage now. Ruth, she, got, she was a Moabite, and she married Boaz and came into this little city just in barley season. Oh, if we had the time this morning to own that, I'd owe my wife six dresses afterwards. But how to dwell on that subject, Neoma, representing the Orthodox Church, was went away on the count of a famine. Went over into the land of Moab like the scattering of Israel, all out among the nations. And then as she came back, she brought back Ruth, the Moabite. And she returned just in barley season, just the gathering in of the first barley. That is, that the Gentile church coming to God just at barley season again. What a beautiful picture there. And then she and Boaz being married. And 
their famous son, Obed, was begotten there and also born. And then his son, great son, Jesse, came from Obed. There also he begat David, his son. The King David come out. Look at this coming up now from Rahab the harlot, her son founding it. From that come, um, from that come Boaz, which brought in another Gentile, and then from Boaz uh, come Jesse. And here Jesse, uh, to Jesse was born David, and David right here at this same little Bethlehem was anointed by the prophet of God to be the king of Israel. All these spiritual things hid from the eyes of the world was happening here in this little city of Bethlehem. See, that's the way God does. Now, I trust that the Holy Spirit will be present now to give you correct understanding. That God doesn't work out in these big things. It's by the Spirit. Not by power, not by might, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. See? God working in the Spirit among the people. See, these great backgrounds, he could only come to this city. That's the only place he could be born. God following his same line. God always does that. God follows the, the line of his word. He cannot go back on his word by no means. And then remain God. He's got to stay with the word. He can never leave that. Today our traditions and so forth take us from the Word. We have creeds and things we inject into the Word, which pollutes the whole thing. But God can never leave the line of His Word. His Word is true always because He is the Word. God and His Word is the same. Now, we see here how that this little Bethlehem yet being unnoticed, a little place not noticed too much to the outside world, just the smallest of the cities, Nobody paid any attention to it, but yet God had in his purpose that, that there's where all these things would happen. Now, the spiritual mind would pick that up because the prophet said here, you see, the prophet said, Thou Bethlehem of Judea, art thou not the least among the princes, but out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. The prophet, the mind of the prophet found it. What's those spiritual Holy Spirit today leading those things. No making difference what the world says and all of its tinsel. What's the Holy Spirit in the Word? There's where it comes. How about when Job died and specified his burial place? Along came Abraham. Abraham bought the parcel of ground to bury his wife, Sarah. And Abraham, when he died, wanted to be buried with Sarah. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac, when he died, wanted to be buried with Abraham. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob died plumbed down in Egypt. But he made Joseph, his prophet's son, swear by him with his hand on his limping hip that he would not bury him down in Egypt. Why? He said, take me up into the land. And there let him be buried. And Joseph, when he died down in Egypt, made mention of the departing of and Israel going out according to the prophecy, but said, take my bones out of this land. Why? They knew the first fruits of the resurrection was coming up from that land because Job said, I know my Redeemer liveth, and at the last days he'll stand upon the earth, and though the skin worms destroy his body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. They knew that first fruits of resurrection was coming out of the promised land, not Egypt. They were spiritual. They were prophets. And when Jesus died on, on Good Friday and raised up on Easter morning the following Sunday morning, the Bible said that many of the saints that slept in the dust of the earth raised up and come out of the graves, went into the city, went on into glory with him. Why? It was them prophets that noted exactly where to be buried at the place and at the time. It's hid from the eyes of the wise, but they knew what, what they looked at the spirit side. The, the first fruits of the resurrection was to come out of Palestine, not out of Egypt. So is it today, friends. So many people hold on to things of the world or some great system or something. Bury me in Jesus for those that are in Christ will God bring with him to that resurrection. I don't care what the world's got to say. How much they try to tinselize things. It's in Christ. Those that are in Christ that God will bring with him. The spiritual mind catches those spiritual things. Here the prophet said, 
Little Bethlehem art thou not the least among all the princes of Judah, but out of thee shall come this governor. Not out of the big self-styled capital, not out of some historical church grounds or something where the Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal or what more started, but out of the least of these. Out of a little insignificant place will I bring forth this place, my ruler of the people. But today we won't say our fathers did this and our fathers did that. See, God ignores every bit of that. God does what he wants to. Watch the line of the Spirit. Watch the way the, the Scripture reads. They were ignorant to that. But you see, the Scripture is what's right. Always God is right. David was anointed by this great prophet to be king. No doubt that Samuel, this great prophet, knew these things beforehand. And it was there that his great promise, spiritual seed, for God swore by an oath that he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne of David. Then where else could Christ be born? Here's his father born, his grandfather's great-grandfather, great-great-great-great-great on back. See, his people in the line of the Gentiles brought in. And now the Bible said that in his name will the Gentiles trust. It all has to be brought in so you can see it. We'd like to stay there for a while and dwell on that and show you why the Gentiles, but I'm sure the spiritual mind will catch this right away now because being the mothers and not the father. Now, because it was the woman, the bride, the Gentile will be made up, the bride will be made up of Gentiles. The Gentile, he'll take a people out of the Gentiles for his name's sake. That's his name. He took a wife. See, out of the Gentiles. That's how it had to be woman come in church. And she were, they were Gentiles, the grandmothers, back in the line of the seed. Now, just as Isaac was in the line of the seed otherwise. Now, notice this. We find out then that David had this promise of a son. Now, we notice how that parallels again with Israel. Well, Israel or Abraham was promised in his seed. What it would be that out of his seed would come this great Savior and he'd be father of the nations. His natural seed, of course, was Isaac, and it failed. But his spiritual seed, by the faith that he had, come Christ, which brought in all of the nations. Well, now, the same thing is parallel here again. David's natural seed was Solomon, and it backslid just like the other seed of Abraham did. It backslid. So did Solomon backslide. He got too many women. And the first thing you know, they let his heart away from God. And the, the way he went and backslid, died that way. A backslid. Israel died in the same way. Backslid. But we find out that this spiritual seed, which was promised by the natural seed as a lineage of people coming through Abraham, but as a, the kingship come through the spiritual promise of David. And David was born in Bethlehem, and he was anointed in Bethlehem. And we find out then that when his real royal uh, seed heir to his throne was born in this same city, little Bethlehem, thou art least amongst all the princes of Judah, but out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. In this little town, little stable, city stable down on the side of the bluff was a cave back in the bluff, and out of there came forth through its little doors the Prince of Peace, born in a stable in a, a little box of, of straw setting somewhere, manure piled up in the barns and so forth, but out of there came that great princess, the seed of the woman, out of there came the Savior of the world, out of there came Jehovah himself in the form of a man, came out of that little humble stable in Bethlehem. Not in some king's palace born in royalty, but there he came from that humble place to a manure stack. Down in there was wrapped in swaddling cloths, as tradition says it was taken from the yoke of an ox where they'd been plowing with it. Poor people, Joseph and Mary, both real poor. And here they was in this little stable. How humble God makes himself. And then we try to make ourselves something great. Can't you see how God humbles himself and takes the things that's not that he might bring to pass his great promises? How that little Jehovah laying in a manger, wrapped in the, the cloth, taken off of the back of a yoke, uh, the neck of a yoke where an ox had been, and wrapped the Prince of Peace in it. 
Well, who are we then? What do we deserve? If God can humble himself like that, oughtn't we to be able to humble ourselves to become his servants if he did things like that? Can't we forget our great in, uh, dignities and things of this world and pass from that and humble ourselves before him this Christmas and be a, show him our appreciations of that birth and that humility by humbling our own selves and receiving his word. No matter what the tradition says, it's his word that counts. That's what he'll take, his word and that only. Now, we find out this little stable. It was there that the first Noel was ever sang on earth. And it was sang by angels. Think of it, the first Noel, not sung up there with Caiaphasus, not down at some great fine church where a wonderful pastor was, but at a stable in Bethlehem, the least among all of them. But the first Noel was sang by angelic beings in the little city of Bethlehem. See what I mean? No matter how poor you are, how little or insignificant you, you might be, God can use you if you just let him do so. God wants you. He don't want you to, you don't have to belong to some great society, some great order, some great uh, brotherhood or whatever it might be. That don't mean nothing to God. God wants you. Amen. And if you're, if you feel that you're great, get that feeling out of you. Got to get it out. You say, well, I have a PhD, LLD. That just takes you that much farther from God. Forget the thing. Come back to God. Come back to the humility of the Spirit and love God and take His Word. And if ye abide me in my Word in you, then ask what you will. It'll be done for you. God promised that. If you say to this mountain, be moved and don't doubt your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, you can have what you said. He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he also. Even greater than this shall he do, for I go to my Father. What promises? There's something lacking somewhere. What we try to do is twist it up and make it some great something up there, put flour and tinsel on it, and we pollute it just like the nations has done Christmas. Right. If we could get the tinsel off of the things, the, the humility back in the human heart, if we could bring the humility back to Christmas, so what it ought to be, not a commercial day, not lights and Santa Clauses, but back to worship in the God of creation who come in a stable and was born a baby, God made flesh and dwelt among us. We could come back to that, get away from the tinsel and the big things. God don't even deal with it at all. You say, well, I belong to the biggest organization. That takes you that much farther from God. You say, I'll do this, that. That just takes you that much further. You've got to humble yourself until you see that. Until if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Then ask what you will. What we try to do this is what God gives us a little shower of blessings. We try to twist it all up and get dignitaries in there that's going to make great big names and outdo the other and this and starts this way and that way and God leaves the whole thing. What we need today is a fresh pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon hearts that's humble. We need a real Christmas, a birthplace. If you could realize that you're nothing but a stable. God didn't go to Jerusalem, to Shiloh or Ramoth Gilead. He come to a stable. That was polluted. You let God, you become and realize in yourself that you're nothing but a stinking stable. But welcome. Open your doors when the, these great big places and the ends are turning him away. Open your doors of the manger of your heart and let Jehovah come into that and watch what takes place. For he is the word. He said, if ye abide me in my word in you, he is the word. Let him come into you. Watch what takes place. Then ask what you will. And it'll be done for you. Yes, it was there. The first Noel was by angels many years ago. And we... And now we know the message must be very important. That God wanted to say that. Or he wouldn't have broken on a message to do something like that. Humble yourselves under the hands of God was the message of it. Now, our Heavenly Father... We know that thou art all wisdom and does everything just right. <clears throat> we pray that you'll grant now that this might be a, a message to the people, that they truly must humble ourselves, all of us, and come under the hand of the mighty God. We commit ourselves to you, Father, that you'll grant this to us in Jesus' name, my son. Amen. Now, to continue on, I was speaking of when the first Noel was saying was sang by angels at little Bethlehem. There's where all these great men were born. That's where the promise of the king was born. The promised king came to that. Now, the word, to get quickly now, so I won't hold you too long. 
they, uh, the promise, the word was this, the word Bethlehem. Let's break it down. I skipped over a few notes here in order to take up the time. Now, Bethlehem, the word B-E-T-H means house. E-L means God in Hebrew. E-L-H-E-M is bread. Bethlehem, the house of God's bread. That's what the word means. Words, names, they have meanings. Many people don't believe that, but that's true. If names don't have some meaning, why did Abram's name have to be changed to Abraham? Why did Sarah have to be changed to Sarah? Why did Saul have to be changed to Paul? Why did Simon have to be changed to Peter? See? All these has meanings. Everything has meanings. And the name Bethlehem means the house of God's bread. Now, how fitting that is that Jesus, the bread of eternal life. Christ is the bread of life. We all believe that, don't we? How fitting Bethlehem there, the bread center of the world, was the bread center of eternal life. That's why the king had to be born there. He said in St. John 6, 35, I am the bread of life that come from God out of heaven. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and all dead. But this bread, if a man eats this bread, he shall live forever then Jesus is the bread of life. So the bread of life had to come at Bethlehem. He is our bread of life for the journey like Israel. God gave Israel bread out of the skies for their journey as they journeyed from where they uh, left Egypt unto the promised land. Bread nightly rained down from the skies. And God gave us the bread of life for our journey Come at Bethlehem, God's house of bread. See how it had to be? It must be where that name is called. Bethlehem, the house of God's bread. Then how could he be born in Jerusalem? How could he be born in Ramoth Gilead? See, he come to where his name was, house of God's bread. Oh, notice Israel received a new fresh bread every night coming down from heaven for their journey. Christ is our life, bread of life, and every day we receive a freshness from Christ from heaven. The Holy Spirit coming down upon the believer every day, fresh. Yesterday's experience, many of us live on yesterday's experience. We mustn't do that. It's today's experience. That's what's the matter with our denominations. They're living on the experience of John Wesley, upon the experience of Dwight Moody, Finney, Sankey, Knox, Calvin. Many of those back there, they're living on that experience. But remember, the bread that fell and they tried to keep it over, it got contaminated. Maggots got in it. Little wiggle tails. And that's what's the matter today. Contaminated cisterns. Living off past bread that's contaminated. We must have something fresh from Christ. His word today for this hour. He is our freshness. Our bread that falls every day from heaven upon the believer. He is our Bethlehem. God's house of eternal life bread. Christ was born in Bethlehem and became God's house of eternal life bread. He is the bread of life. He is our Bethlehem. Christ is our Bethlehem. Natural bread is called the staff of life. We call the natural bread like our light bread and stuff we get is called the staff of life. Jesus is God's life staff, of, a, a bread of life staff for eternal life. As the staff of life is called bread, Jesus being the bread of life is God's staff of eternal life bread to us. We can't go. Something must die so we can eat. This morning when you eat, you eat dead substance. If something doesn't die, then you cannot live because you only live by dead substance. If you eat meat, the hog died. If you eat pork, the hog died, of course. Then if you eat uh, uh, beef, the cow died. If you say, but I eat bread, then the wheat died. Well, I eat greens, the greens died. You only live by dead substance, and that's the only way you can live. Then if you can only live natural, by dead substance, something had to die so you can live natural, how much more did something have to die so you can live eternally? Christ died 
that we might live eternally and he become the house of God's eternal life bread that we catch freshly every hour of the day coming down from God out of heaven in the form of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Feeds our hungry souls as we sit together in heavenly places. He is our Bethlehem. Then all true believing sons of God are born in Bethlehem with him. If Christ had to become the bread of life to be born in Bethlehem, which is life's bread house, then every one of true believers in Christ is born in Christ. They are born in God's Bethlehem. Amen. Then only Jesus was born in Bethlehem. I was born in Bethlehem. You were born in Bethlehem. How did you do it? Right here in Phoenix, Arizona this morning in the Ramada. You can be born again in God's Bethlehem house of Hallelujah. eternal bread life. Hallelujah. Either live forever. Why, little Bethlehem? That's the day. Why, a bunch of little holy rollers? Why, this, that, or the other? The people don't know what it's all about. But the Spirit reveals it. The Word shows it. It's a manifestation of God's Word. We have life through Christ and Him alone. Our organizations, our denominations, our differences only separates us from God. We have one access to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. There's not another way that we can come through, but no priest, no preacher, no system or nothing else. Only Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He's God's bread of life. Hallelujah. And we are born in Him. And if He is God's bread of life, then He is Bethlehem. And being born in Christ, we are then God born in Bethlehem, in Christ Jesus. Setting together in heavenly places, eating of Him. Eating of Him. Who is He? He's the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. And when we can set with one objective, the Word of God, and feed upon that, we are in God's spiritual Bethlehem, eating God's spiritual bread, and our souls punctuating every word that He spoke with an amen. We enjoy this heavenly angel food. When it says, these signs shall follow them that believe. The creed and denomination says, oh, it isn't so. But the real man who's born in Bethlehem says, amen. amen. The works that I do shall you do also. The denomination says it's a bunch of work up emotion. But the real Bethlehem dweller says, amen. amen. Because he's satisfied. That's angel food. If ye abide in me and my words and you ask what you will, that'll be done for you. Right. Amen. All the... High and prudent will never sit. We hold so much to our traditions of the elders, so much that we have to pack cards and everything else to get in some pulpit. That ain't it. You can get in God's pulpit by humbling yourselves. Come into the house of the bread of life, Jesus Christ, and live forever in His presence. And lifted up in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, feasting on the Word. That's God's Bethlehem. How many of us is in it this morning? How many is willing to forget your traditions? How many is willing to forget your creed that disagrees with the Word? Why have we got a revival? Why haven't we got these things going on? What's the matter with Pentecost? It organized itself. That's it. You can't organize Pentecost. You can make an organization, but the Pentecost is a blessing. It's a power of God. And if it's a genuine Pentecost, it'll never bypass a word for a creed. It'll take the Word. Right. Because it's circumcised. From the world and the things of the world, it sets only on the Word of God and believes it. We're in Bethlehem, candidates for the kingdom of God. We're eating God's eternal life bread, born God bread, born in Bethlehem to become the spiritual bread of life, of eternal life in the house of God. Oh, my, born in Bethlehem, we are this morning when we're born in Jesus Christ, for He is God's Bethlehem. Jesus is God's house of eternal life bread. He also is our water for the journey. Now we know that He is the water. Like Israel in their journey, either they smote a rock and the bread come down out of heaven, but a rock was smitten so that they could drink from it for the sustainings of their life in the journey. God smote a rock or had Moses to do it, his prophet. Smoked the rock. What was it? Open the rock. If the rock was Christ, do you believe it? Yes. All right, then. If the prophet opened the rock so life could come out, then if it is the rock, today we need the Holy Spirit in some man who will smite back the rock. Yes. Amen. And let the Word come out because He is the Word. Yes. 
we bypassed on creeds and drinking stagnated water from cisterns. What we need today is the opening of the Word that lives and He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot fail. They can call it mental telepathy. They can say whatever they want to or spiritualist or, or devil as long as that word's flowing free and producing exactly what it said it would do. It's a fountain in the house of David again. Back in Bethlehem where the Jesus Christ is saying yesterday and day forever through His Bethlehem dwellers live with it. Live in it. It's life journeying water for us as Israel had. One of great David's great experiences if you want to read about it in 2 Samuel uh, 35, 15 beginning. We read out there that David had been born in Bethlehem, but yet he become a fugitive. Oh, what a sight. The Philistines were garrisoned at that time in the land because Saul, the great man had brought all Israel into sin, had fell away from God and become an enemy to God. And it had been garrisoned. The Philistines were garrisoned around Bethlehem, and David, trying to get back to his own home, could not do it. and was out in the wilderness because... He had become a fugitive to the people uh, that was ousted. What a beautiful picture that is of Christ today. A fugitive. He is. Now you say that can't be. Well, if you believe the Bible, it is. The Bible said in the Lady of Sin Church Age that Christ was on the outside of the church knocking, trying to get back in his own church. A fugitive is something has been refused, rejected. And the Word and the Holy Spirit is rejected. That's right. You can't get in there. If you ever received him, you got to get out of there to get him. You got to go out to him. He can't get in. They're so set on their creeds that they, they won't let you preach them things. They won't let you believe those things. They say, Do you believe he's the same? Oh, in a way, he's the same. Now, that's not living in Bethlehem. No, no. That's drinking at a stagnated cistern. Way back old contaminated bread that fell several years ago. What did so and so say about it? They might have been all right in their day. This is another day. This is the day of the Lord. This is another church age, not the Philadelphia, and this is the Lady of Sia. It's a rejected, and Christ has become a fugitive in his own church, pushed out. He's far, and he can come right down and work right among the people and do the same things that he did here, saying that he would do it in the last days, give the same signs and things that he said he would do as it was in the days of Sodom. We know what he'd done to the church there. We see Billy Graham as it was, and messengers went out in the church denomination and preaching down in there, and there called them out. Tell them to believe the word and to come out of Sodom. Abraham's group wasn't in Sodom. They was already called out. Watch the angel, what he did up there for them for a sign that they know. And the same thing can be done. And people say, oh, well, don't believe. Why? Why? Because if they have made Christ the fugitive to their organization, they're so far and with it, Pentecostal and all together. Now, that's just exactly the truth. I know that scratches. But listen, if anything it don't, if it's truth, it will scratch. That's right. It's got to be true. Now, now watch. David, when he's up there, David dreamed of his mighty victories. He was in a cave, staying back and way away from about 15 miles out of the city. And he come up and noticed that there, his own beloved city, where he'd been born and where he'd been anointed king and, and so forth there, the dwellers in Israel in them days was something like it is today in Germany. They have the little cities and then... They live in the cities for protection, and then they take their sheep and their uh, stock out in the country and feed them and drive them back in in the evening time, put them in the, the corrals. And David, looking down upon the city, uh, began to remember the mighty deeds that God had done by him, the great mighty victories that God had won uh, by him. How that one day while he had his sheep up there in the mountains where he was, he's laying down there by the green pastures and so forth, a bear come in and got one of the little lambs and tuck it out and he went after it and he killed the bear. God gave him victory because he was uh, detailed by his father to take care of those sheep. That was, his, that was his job. Take care of the sheep. Oh, pastor, that's your job. Amen. And they eat sheep food. Not almanacs. Sheep food. God's word. Someone come in and got one, run out. Someone come in and got one and tuck out. He went after it. A lion come in and tuck one. He went after it. He wasn't satisfied until he got it. That gave him that great victory one day when he seen Israel all backed up. See, 
Israel had been hearing all the creeds and everything that all that all went to church, that all been circumcised, they all went to the priests and got their blessings before they went to battle. But when it come down to the showdown of the supernatural, they were everyone cowards. Because they seen something was an opposition. And they didn't have the audacity. They, they didn't have what we would call today the, the street word. They didn't have the, the, the go get it. They were something lacking. They could not go out there and face that giant. Why? But they was all blessed by the priests. They had the holy blessings up on them. And they'd knelt and probably been anointed with the holy waters and whatever it was. And there they was all standing out there. But when the opposition was so great, they didn't have it. There stood Saul, the general overseer, or the bishop, standing out there, head and shoulders above his army. And he made a challenge, Goliath did, and said, If I kill him, then you'll serve us. But if he kills me, then we'll serve you. But the opposition is too great. He had 14-inch fingers. That would be 28 inches across his hand. Look what a hand he had. His, his needle... Uh, a weaver's needle like his spear he had and think how big his head would be be about like a tub and there would be a, a helmet of inch or two thick of brass hanging over his head look at the armor uh, pieces of armor like one of these jealousy windows where he could breathe and move himself that's the way the armors work with that great coat of nail hanging on him weighed, weighed 100 pounds or 200 pounds of brass hanging over his chest with a, with a needle spear in his hand maybe 35 feet long what the enemy can do when he thinks he's got the odds on you. What he thinks he can do. Hey, I'll make the boast. The days of miracles is past. You can't get by with such a thing as that. But there come up a little ruddy looking fella that hadn't had no theological experience, but it had an experience that God still remained God. God keeps his word. Jerry come up and Saul said, Well, I'll, I'll give you a bachelor of art. He put his helmet on him and it sunk him down. He didn't know nothing about that. He said, I don't know nothing about them kind of things. He said, I don't know. But I know one thing. That are you afraid to go fight that giant? And you stand here and call yourself the church of the living God. And let that uncircumcised unbeliever stand out there and make such boast as that. So said, I'll go fight him. Oh, we need man like that today. Man who's had an experience. What did he do? What did little David of Bethlehem do? Went out there to fight the giant. The giant cursed him in the name of his gods. Gods, plural. Cursed him in the name of his giants. There, his gods went out there and said, Today I'll take you by my spear and I'll hang your carcass up there in the tree and let the birds eat it. He said, You meet me as a Philistine in the name of a Philistine with an armor and a spear, but I'll meet you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. What was it? The Word. The Word. I'll meet you with the Word. He said, the day I'll cut your head from your shoulders. That giant laughed and tucked after him. And David didn't back up. He tucked after him too. There's only one little place and God directed the rock. David then appears a fugitive. He was thinking about that. How that great victory was. Then he must have got to thinking about the Psalms. How sometimes out there in the mountains he'd lay and meditate on God. He said he tied his commandments on his, his bedpost and his fingers. And everywhere he go, I always got the Lord before me. Always. I shall not be moved. He kept God before him. And the great victories he had. When he gets so inspired, he was a psalmist. He'd jump up and take his pen and write down the psalms and sing them. And he'd get into the spirit and dance and dance and dance in the spirit. How he gets so carried away in the spirit. He'd dance in the spirit by writing these psalms. And he must have come over the different psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The 23rd psalm, he leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. Oh, he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yet, though I walk through the valley, shut of death, I fear no evil. Thou art with me. And as he thought on those things, it must have been a hot day. He got thirsty, hot and sweating. He could look way down in the valley from the top of the mountains on the east side or the west side of the east side it is of the city. When he looked down and seen where he, the Philistines all down there, thousands of them garrisoned around, he seen that old well where he once drank from. Oh, he began to think of a morning when he'd take his sheep, go out to, to feed them. He'd pass by this old well because it was a great place of water. And then he'd go there and he would drink water and drink for, let his sheep drink. How there at Bethlehem, where he watered his sheep. That's exactly where God waters his sheep again today. Right back at Bethlehem. His cool, fresh water. 
He cried out, if I only had a drink from that well again. Amen. I'm going to close now. Listen close. If I only had a drink inside of him, cried out, if I could only drink once more from that well at Bethlehem. His desires was a commandment to those who loved him. Remember, his soul was crying for a drink of that water. And those who loved him, his least desire was a command. We're told that one of three of those men got together. Great man, one killed 800 by himself. The other jumped into a pit and killed a lion. One took a stick and knocked a uh, spear out of an Egyptian's hand, slew him with his own spear and stood on a field of lintel like that and killed 300 around him. Great man! They were Gentiles. Watch where they come from. David here is a type of Christ. Bethlehem calls Christ as David's son. Here he stand there crying for a drink of that water. And his desire was a command. I said to those who loved him, three of those men pulled their swords and fought 15 miles of man down to that city while others fought keeping them or gallant fighting man, those Philistines, twice their size, some of them. But they were man gallant who could fight. One of them slew, stood alone, handed and killed 800 men right around him in one day. They were a great man. They trusted God. They had faith in their leader. And they cut his way down through until while some of them cut another, got a bucket of water. And they cut their way back to another 15 miles of man and brought that up to David so he could drink it. Here Christ is represented here in this both king and warrior because he cut his way through. He broke the enemy's lines of death. He broke the enemy's lines of, well, that we might have eternal life, the waters of eternal life. He come through even to death and took death upon himself and died the death and come back that we might have eternal life. He's both king and warrior. We didn't conquer. It's already conquered. We never conquered death. He conquered death for us. He's our David of this day. He conquered death, Bethlehem's bread and water. Bethlehem was a center. You uh, historians know that. It was a center. There's a great wheat country in there. From the irrigation stuff, they could have great wheat crops. And it's also the best water. It was the bread center and the water center of Palestine. And today, no matter how many organizations we got, how many other so-called brethren, and which they may be, still Christ is the believer's Bethlehem. He is the place of bread and water. Methodist, that's good for you. That's good for you, Baptists, you Pentecostals, the rest of you. It's all one place. That's Bethlehem. It's where bread and water of life comes from. There. Here he is our bread, God's bread and water for us. He's the sinner. The only place that you can come and get it is from him. God's house in the person of Jesus Christ, our Bethlehem, bread and waters of eternal life, and he is the word made flesh. Here is the word. The bread and water of life. Hebrews 13, 8 says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That makes him our Bethlehem, our place of bread and water, the only place of eternal life. Notice, David, and getting the waters, he never drank it. He said, God forbid, this is the blood of these men that jeopardize their lives to go out and to bring him that drink. Watch. He poured it up on the ground for a drink offering to God. Amen. Amen. Man and brethren, rise your faith just a minute now. He refused to drink it himself. He poured it up on the ground for a drink offering to, to God. How fitting that is to John 3, 16. When God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son... Jesus, the Prince of Life, come here, didn't have to die. He conquered death himself and poured his own life's blood out upon the ground. Amen. Amen. As an offering for our sin. He's our smitten rock. Up on the ground, his precious God-given blood. I heard someone say to the night, in a message, said that they come to, I believe it was Billy Graham last night, was watching him as he said, that he went to Israel and he went into Palestine and he said, I come to believe your people, something on that order. And I certainly admired him as he appeared on that worldly program last night. Many of you turned the man down for doing that, but look here, he got before the whole nation then and he never took it back. He stood just exactly on what he believed. Right. And I certainly admire him for that. 
And he said, I went to Israel and I told him, I worship one of your children. In other words, like this, I thought, Billy, that's wonderful. I'd like to see that God-given power that you have to stand there in the midst of all that Hollywood glamour and give a testimony of Jesus Christ. But he was not a Jew. Jesus was God, not a Jew. You remember, the blood cell comes from the male sect. And he was not no man, Jew or Gentile. He was God created in flesh. We're not saved by the blood of a Jew or blood of a Gentile. We're saved by the blood of God. He was God, nothing less. He wasn't Jew nor Gentile. God's created blood in him. We become, if he was a Jew or Gentile, we're all lost. He was God in flesh. Right. I don't worship a Jew. I worship God when I worship Jesus Christ. I don't worship some fiction or some kind of a historical something. I worship Jesus Christ, the presence of Jesus Christ right now, which is his word that's manifested in this age. God in every age lauded his word from the beginning. And every time each one of those ages pass by, God sends down an anointed prophet for that age. In the days of Noah, the days of all the rest of them, when he made the promises. I don't care what kind of a condition the church got into. He always does that. He sends a man anointed. For the word of the Lord comes to the prophets. And here he stood there, each prophet, and was condemned by the organizations of that day. But he stood on the word and made the word live. Jesus was the fullness of God's word. For he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in him dwelt the fullness of God. God lived in Jesus Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Not Jew nor Gentile, but God. There he stood making himself how fitting that God's own blood had to shed up on the ground from the innocent blood of Abel on down to redeem us. He didn't take his own life. He didn't hold his own life. He said, Father, is it possible this cup should pass from me? But nevertheless, not my will, thine be done. He give in to the word. Today we can do the same thing. You can either take your creeds, take your so-and-so and go wherever you want to with it. But you can say, not my will, but thine be done. Come back to that word of God. Take your tinsel of Christmas and do what with it you want to. But give me Jesus Christ in my heart. No matter how humble it is, how people laugh at it. Or what, what's, what's its nature? See if it does just like he did. If it didn't, then don't compare with this word. Leave it alone. It's not Christ, because Christ is the Word. Now we find how fitting it was. Our rock smitten, His blood, life poured upon the ground, a sin offering for the sinner. Our Bethlehem, water, bread, and life offered to cleansing for us unclean sinners. Oh, sinner friend of mine, how can you refuse so foolishly such an offering when God gave His only begotten Son a sin offering that whosoever believeth in him, in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. How do you get into him? By one spirit. We're all baptized into one Bethlehem. The word of God, which is Christ made manifest for this age and ever promise that the Bible gives at this age. He's waiting for some prophet to rise on the scene to manifest that he promised it according to Malachi 4. It'll be done no matter how foolish the people think. It'll be done anyhow. God said so. He's able of these stones. If our creeds won't receive it, if our churches won't receive it, God can go back to the stable. He can go anywhere He wants to. But there'll be somebody stand up for this word spoke for this day. Something has to manifest it. It won't be a group either. It never was. Oh, sons, warriors, as a close. I don't want to keep you here too long. I'm going to close right now, the Lord willing. Five minutes till 11 or six minutes, rather. Notice, oh, warrior sons, you men and here, a claim to be son. Did you know what David represented? David represented Christ. He was, Christ was the son of David. Now listen to closing. Those Gentile warriors, many of them, notice, they come from everywhere. But they know that that fugitive was anointed. They knew David was rejected by his own people. But they know that the anointing was on him. They could see it. So they stood right by his side and die or live. They were gallant men. No matter how much the outside world didn't believe it, his own people kicked him out. They didn't want nothing to do with him. Saul ran him out. The head of the denomination kicked him out and had nothing to do with it. The council kicked him out and he become a fugitive. He had to go to wherever he could. There he was up in the mountains. But there was a little group of men of Gentiles and so forth made up that they looked in that man and they know he was coming king. 
So is it today with real gallant soldiers of faith of that word who knows that word promises that Jesus Christ will return. We ain't interested in millions of dollars of this and millions of dollars of that. I'm interested in the return of Christ Jesus. Oh, warrior sons of God. What's the matter with you? How do you stand today? When we see it, the Bible predicts that he's a fugitive today, turned out of his church, turned out of the organizations. You know it. No need to hide around about it. It's the truth. The Bible said it would be that way. Come out from them marks of the beast. Look at these men. They pulled their swords. What was it? His desire was a drink of cool water. David, what a type of today. Our David, Christ. We know he's called a holy roller. He's cast off to one side, a fanatic and everything, rejected by the churches. They've got their creeds and things drawn up at this Christmas like they did the first one. We know that. But we know that this word ever remains true. And it's got to be fulfilled. And the desire of Christ is for man, warriors to stand. Amen. Oh, come stand with me by my side. I'm standing... In a terrible place. I challenge today these tapes go over the world. I challenge some man, some lawyer who loves Jesus Christ that knows that these things has got to be fulfilled today. Brethren, come stand by my side and pull the word of God. Forget those dry cisterns and stagnated denominations you're living in. Pull the fresh word of God. Let's give Jesus a good drink of fresh Pentecostal water. That's his desire today. Back to original Pentecost. Back to the word. His prophesied we do so in Malachi, the fourth chapter. Return the faith of the children back to the fathers again. Who would stand this morning like David. We know that David is coming into power. Jesus Christ is going to take the world. He inherits the earth. He is going to be king over the earth. He's rejected today. He's a fugitive among his people. Of course, he's a fugitive to the world. Always was. But today, he's a fugitive to his own church. They reject him. They love their creeds and big dignitaries instead of the word. They won't let it be manifested. They won't let it be preached in its power. They've cut away from it. Just like the Bible said they do in Revelation 17. What are they doing? Going up here today and all going to this council of churches. Catholicism and Protestantism uniting together, making them bark in the image of the beast. And Protestants falling right for it. Pentecostals everywhere. Dignitaries going into Rome from Pentecost and coming back to the most spiritual place. And in Texas and everywhere else, they're opening up and giving understanding of the stations and so forth. Knowing that that's creed's been injected to this word. Oh, you Bethlehem dwellers. Hallelujah. I call for man warriors who's not afraid. I don't care if he's 800 standing on one side and 10,000 on the other. I want warriors who will come with me and cut a hole through this line of unbelieving Philistines. The world council has got the garrison around the word of God trying to make it creeds and feed the people. There's a well. There's a fountain open in the house of David. Bethlehem. For sin and uncleanliness. Brother, sin is unbelief in his word. Amen. Who warrior that can see the millennium coming? What warrior can see this great Holy Spirit coming in the form of Jesus Christ? The literal body of Christ to take over again. Stand with me. Stand by me. Let's cut a hole through this denominational creed. Let's get in there. He's crying for a good fresh drink of Pentecostal water. Original Pentecost, not a bunch of carrying on, screaming, hollering. Carrying on, I mean, a genuine Holy Spirit baptism that produces the life of Jesus Christ back into the person. Amen. Forgive me if I hurt you. No, don't you do it. I'm doing this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Come back. Stand, you gallant man who see David standing out there. Jesus Christ, a fugitive from his church. Born out by the creeds. There's a fresh fountain hanging there. Amen. 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 There's power to make this word live again. Amen. It's prophesied in this day to come to pass. Yes. God said it would come to pass. Amen. It's got to come to pass. Amen. You'll never do it in the army you're in now. You're garrisoning yourself, Pentecost. Right around with the rest of the organizations. Cutting it into a creed. 
Oh, man of God, where's that sword? Our Lord desires a fresh drink. I don't care if it's life or death. Let's cut through this thing. It's a hard standing by yourself. I'm calling for a man to stand by me. Stand with your word. What that word says, do it just the way the word said. I don't care what anything else says, stay it that way. But that's the only thing that'll cut. Let's get to Bethlehem, the true water of God. If a man abide me and I in him, if ye abide me in my words and you abiding, not just jumping from place to place and swapping your fellowship card from a oneness to a two-ness and a three-ness and back to a Presbyterian Lutheran, ye abide in me and he is the word. My words abide in you. Don't be afraid of 800 or 8 million. I'll stand by your side. I desire to drink from that well again. God's going to have a people that will drink from that well. Hallelujah. You might think I'm crazy. Maybe I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm crazy about Jesus Christ and his word. If I have to be called a fool. Let me be called a fool for his word. I've never been against the man in them organizations. I'm against that system that's barring the word of God out. Let's cut warriors. Stand by us. Let's go into that well. He's our Bethlehem. These old cisterns, the World Council of Churches organizing now. Let's restore the fresh word of God, not a denomination. Let's not take a creed. That's old stagnated cisterns that fell 40 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or either last year. I want God's word as promised for today. That's the drink he wants me to have. This word today. It's a little Bethlehem. It's rejected. It's, I know it's just like, you think, well, if my, oh yes, that's right. They thought he should be born in Jerusalem. They thought he should be born where their denomination heads was. But he turned by all that. He come to the name Bethlehem, for that's what he was. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He's not coming for Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, or Pentecostals. He's coming for the bride, Jesus Christ. That's who he's coming for. They seem strange to you, but believe it. See these types? They can come no other way but by the Word. That's the only place He could be born is by that Bethlehem. That's why it had to be that little humble place. That's the way it has to be this morning. It has to be the same way by the promised Word. Yes, sir. The Philistine Council of Churches now organizing garrisons everywhere around our Bethlehem. Around this Christmas, there are garrisons around there. Everywhere it's all decorated up with worldly tinsel. Oh, we'll bring world peace. Pope Luther John, or whatever his name is, he'll get together, and all the great bishops of the church, the United Council of Churches, and the World Council, all coming together. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Amen. Amen. There's only one you can walk with, that's Jesus Christ. Huh? How can you walk with him when you agree with who he is, the Word? Don't you let that leave you. I don't care about how much tension they got. you got to do this or we'll go to close up your church. Or I don't care what they close up. It has nothing to do with the Word. Yes, sir. Where you're going, just exactly what the Word said you were doing. Going right back, all dressed in worldly tinsel with all kind of worldly promises, but it's away from the Word a million miles. There it is today, Christmas again, to keep us from the promise of the Word. But it shall be fulfilled. God's able of these stones to rise children to Abraham. Ah, trying to keep the real true Bethlehem dwellers away from eternal life. That's their purpose. Rise, ye sons of the warriors. Let's cut back to our original Bethlehem. Remember when David come uh, to his throne, these men stood by him because he knowed, they knowed he was coming to the throne. They know that David was going to be on the throne no matter how much he rejected out. He was the worst uh, fugitive in the land. So is the true word of God this morning. It's foreign to organizations. Look what they've done. That shows it right before you. People try to say, Brother Bram, you're knocking the church. I'm knocking them systems. The church is Jesus Christ. Not a system. And today, look what they've done. Look what they're doing. And you can see what they're doing. They're trying to keep the people from that. They're garrisoning more and more around that well to be sure that nobody will drink from it. But, oh, warriors of God, I believe that Jesus Christ will come someday in glory. I believe he'll come and sit on the throne of his father, David. 
Though he be a fugitive, his word this morning rejected by his own people like David was. The organization has turned out his word. They turned out when God comes and vindicates his pure word. Don't tell me for years it's crossed the country and they get farther away from it at all times. I said the other day about Jacqueline Kennedy, how many times I've rebuked you women for cutting your hair, wearing makeup, you Pentecostal women, cutting your hair, which God said it's a, you, you, you make yourself a, a street harlot when you do it. According to God, your husband has no right to live with you any longer. A woman that cuts her hair dishonors her head, which is her husband. That's so exactly what I say about it. You call me out on it. I get the letters. You old crank. All oh, right, they called Elijah the same thing. They called every word of God, every time word is made. Call it. Somebody said today, "One, of, we believe you to be a prophet." I never said that. I don't tell. I ain't no prophet. I'm just God's servant. You're trying to tell you the truth. Amen. That's all. Let me tell you, the word of God stands for that. He said, "The daughters of Zion, the branch had escaped in that day of all this contamination. It'll be glorious in the sight of the Lord." Cut through women. You got your place to cut through whirly Hollywood and picture shows and all this television stuff that you try to pattern after. Dress yourself sexy out on the street and someone said, why the people want you to teach them how to receive the Holy Ghost and how to get... Say that you got the Holy Ghost and then deny the word your own life proves you haven't got it. Amen. I'm not angry. I'm just telling you what's the truth. Look at yourself and find out. Paul said, if an angel from heaven taught anything else, let him be accursed. Galatians 1.8. That's right. What if Jacqueline Kennedy, she did set the pace of women, all these waterhead haircuts and things that they have, all these sexy dresses and like uh, motherhood dresses and things. Every woman in the country wants to wear them. You Pentecostals too. Look, Jacqueline Kennedy never did hear a message like this. If she would have heard it, she might have repented long ago. But you Pentecostal women, you're day in and out, year in and out, and still you do nothing about it. Amen. Hallelujah. God's going to get tired one of these days. God will get tired. Well, I know you think I'm crazy. Go ahead. It's all right. They thought that all down through the ages when the word. Eh. Oh, warriors, pull that sword. Let's stand for everything that sword stands for. Let's get to that well. Where there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Amen. Not a Jew, Emmanuel's veins. God with us, where sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilt. And there shall come forth a ruler out of Bethlehem that shall rule over my people. The Holy Spirit today rules over the people. And the Holy Spirit is the Word. Is that right? I'm closing reverently. He rules the people. No matter what you think, you cope with the Word. If you don't, the Holy Spirit's not there. You bear a record of your own testimony. No matter what you say, you could jump up and down, speak in tongues, run over the floor. Still have bobbed hair and doing the things you're doing that testifies against you that it's not so. Amen. Bethlehem dwellers. God bless you. Let's go through. Amen. Christ wants a real church. Amen. He wants a bride. Let's cut our way through. Get out of here. Get these creeds away that the real drinkers might come back and get a drink of real cool Pentecostal water that once flowed from this great well is still flowing. Won't you come today and believe that with all your heart while we bow our heads just a moment? i got many things here I should speak on. Time won't permit. It's 11 o'clock now. I wonder how many warriors in here, you ministers, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic priest, whatever you might be, you're convinced. I know I'm not a clergyman. I might have come out of the wilderness with chopped up this, that, and the other. But this is the Word. You believe it's so. You believe it's the Word. That's the Bethlehem. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone. Every word that cometh from the mouth of God. And the Word is sure the Bible. Man shall live by that. And He is that Word. Oh, warrior, will you pull the sword of God and say, I'm through with these traditions. I'm coming back to the Word. I'm coming back to truth. Women, man, women, it's your shame to yourself the way you've been doing. Are you willing this morning at this Christmas to come back and reflect the real Jesus Christ? Now, with your heads bowed and every eye closed, would you raise your hand and say, Pray, Brother Branham. Truly, I want to do that in my heart. I am, I believe it. God bless you. My ministers, women everywhere. In Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the place 
of the bread and water of God. Christ, our glorious Bethlehem. How do we get into him? 1 Corinthians 15. By one spirit, we're all baptized into the mythical body of Jesus Christ. We feed upon his word, not anything else, sheep food alone. That word, nothing else. You can't put no creed in it. We won't listen to it. No, sir. You're going to say, well, it's this way. If the Bible says it's this way, this is the way we want it. We don't want it seasoned up. We want it just the way it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, our Father, today there's hungry hearts still left on the earth. Why, little Bethlehem, in my poor, unlearned way, Lord, I've tried to let this little group which loves me. I know they do, Lord. And I love them. I love them so much to Lord. I, I'm zealous of them. I don't want to see them mixed up in these great things and get cut off then when it's too late. And see them poor souls yonder in prison. I know it wants to have the opportunity. Lord God, today, no matter what the great Jerusalems and thinks and what the Gileads and the Ramoth Gilead and whatever more, Shiloh's and the great worship places, wherever they are, there is a Bethlehem. Art thou not least among all of them? But out of thee, out from the Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, the great capital, and the Ramoth Gileads where Luther fought, and, and the, uh, the uh, Shiloh's where maybe Wesley fought, and, and many other places. But Lord, Lord, you raised up a Pentecostal group, and if they haven't turned right around and done the same thing, Jesus of Nazareth, I pray thee, Lord, to let warriors out of every one of these creeds back there rise in your name. Cut through all these creeds and get back to the true unadulterated word. Laying aside every weight that is easily beset them. Laying aside every hour that they're out here foolishly dropping around trying to make members of an organization. Lord God, let them come back to get converts to Jesus Christ. Not to glorify any organization or any persons, but Jesus Christ. He alone, it was David those men fought for. It was David they set their life in jeopardy for. And them great mighty warriors without fear, they moved their way through there because it was his desire. It was his desire to have a drink from that well. Lord God, maybe we don't feel that just that tug, but look, it's your desire that these things be done. As you said to John, thus it is behooving to us or becoming that we fulfill all righteousness. It's becoming to us as ministers today to see that this word is preached, to see that it's done. It's becoming to us a man of these hours that we're living in, great man in the earth today. Oh, God, they're out there. Let them see it and grab the sword. No matter what the opposition is, if God be for you, who can be against you? We don't care jeopardizing our social living. We don't care jeopardizing this, that, or the other. We want to get the water of life back. Let us go to Bethlehem, Lord. Let every one of them, let all these women, that surely if they put up their hand, they was ashamed of themselves. Let them realize that these men will be like Mr. Kennedy one of these days. They'll, they'll be like the rest of man. They have to die. These women are dying. I'm dying. We're all burning up here on earth. And know that it's a short time. We've only got a very few days left. God, instead of trying to build big systems, Lord, let man and women see this morning, it's the coming of a king. Oh, God, the coming of that great king, Jesus. And, it, and we realize, God, that every one of those men that pulled that sword and fought for David when he was a fugitive, when he come into power, he made them rulers over cities. Every one of them had cities. And you promised that in the Bible, that we would have cities Oh, God, as Gentiles <coughs> fell heir through the Gentiles that we might be partakers of His holiness and His righteousness. Let us today, Lord, as man warriors, take that word, knowing that those who stand for Him in this hour, they'll be rulers over cities. Not as we want to be rulers, but we want to be servants to You, Lord. Oh, God, we see the vision of this little minority, this little group, This is what's called fanaticism. And Paul said in his day, in the way that's called heresy. Crazy. That's where I want to fight, Lord. Thy word is truth. Thou art the word. The same yesterday, today, and forever. O God, anoint us with thy word. And bring thy word promised to this day to pass. May we leave this building this morning as shining instruments of God. May we go with the sword, it glittering in the air to cut away every weight and everything else. 
till we can get back the people to Christ, bring a cool, fresh drink to our Lord, instead of all these old stagnated creeds, let the people drink from the fountain of real, cool, refreshing Pentecostal blessing, that it might bless his heart and bring him back among us again. Grant it, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. While we have our heads bowed, if the pianist or organist or whatever it is will go to the organ, piano, I want us quietly to sing this. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. When sinners plunge beneath the flood, sinner, what is sinner? Unbeliever. Unbelievers plunge. Unbelieve in what? The Word. Oh, those Jews, they didn't want to believe it. They were unbelievers. They thought they were saved. But God knew they needed a Savior. They was praying for a warrior. God give them a baby, a Savior. He knew what they need. That's their Christmas present. That's what she need today. That's what I need today. A Savior for my unbelief. A Savior for your unbelief. While we sing, let's just pray about it now in our hearts. Just pray sincerely, please, church. There is... A fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners, unbelievers, blood, not a church member now. The, that's where church members plunge. Luke, all oh, their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stain. Oh, lose all their guilty stain. And sin. Lord Jesus, I pray now that you'll receive us. I'm putting myself right here at this group, Lord. Take all my unbelief, Lord, away from me. Let me die, Lord, as Samson cried. Let me die with these Philistines. Let me do whatever it may be for me to do, but God cleanse my soul. Take all doubt away. If there's anything in this word that I don't believe, Lord, if, if there's not something here that you promised that I can't see my own life be vindicate that word for this day, then, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Give me courage. Oh, Lord, I need courage to Cut down this thing. Cut this wall, for I know it's your desire. You spoke it. It should be in this day. As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. We see this last move, this last sign that's been given to the church. That was the last sign of Abraham's natural seed, Saul, before the fire burned up the Gentile world. And so is it the last sign that his royal seed will see before the fire burns up the Gentile world. You, Lord, may they see that's just exactly the reason Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem. It's your word. It's your promise. Bless them now, Father. I give them to you as trophies. And may we together, Lord, pull the word today and march forward in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Do you love the Lord Jesus? Do you believe that's the truth? Raise up your hands if you believe it's the truth. Thank you, friends. Look. I am, I guess the tape's off. See, in speaking here, I'm not just speaking just to you. That tape goes around the world. And men and women around the world hear that. We go to nation after nation after nation. They just they sit there with little tubes in their ears and, and speak that right out to hundreds and hundreds of people around the world. And look, it's not, now you women, I don't want to hurt your feelings when I tell you them things. But if your pastor don't tell you that, there's something wrong with him. He ain't, he ain't got the audacity to do it. He's hiding behind an organization or he's like Lot, sitting down before the fire fell. He, he just didn't have the real, the real stuff to take to stand out there. He, the Bible said that the sins of Sodom vexed his righteous soul daily. His soul no better, but he didn't have the, the real uh, thing it taken to stand out there and condemn him. And a pastor that won't tell a woman it's wrong to cut her hair, there's something wrong with that man. And to wear these clothes. And you man, you man that'll let your women do such things as that, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? Lead your wife around through town as a like a public prostitute? And then slap some man in the mouth if he didn't sell her? You're the one who needs slapping in the mouth. That's, that's right. And God will do it someday too. That's right. We need to get back to this word. Not only that, that's just a little little thing. But how are you going to get the big things if you refuse the little ones? 
How can you learn algebra if you don't know ABC? If you can't count to ten, how are you going to know your mathematics? You've got to start from the bottom. You're trying to begin at the top. Come down here and get started right. Amen. This is the time to do it now. Christmas. It was a birth of Christ. Let Christ be born in us. What is Christ? Christ is a word. How many knows that? In the beginning was a word. The word is with God and the word was God. Somebody said today, said, Brother Brandon, you uh, people know it. You're a woman hater. I am not. I am not. I got genuine love for my sisters. Some man will turn around and think you look nice with red eyes and green eyes and bobbed hair. That man has got a different opinion than what I'd have. Your I love that soul that's in you that's got to meet God. That's what I'm my sister for eternity. Not some little sex thing here on earth. Though. How many ever read the decline of uh, the fall of Rome? Sure. Look at there. Just the same thing we're doing. Sex appeal. Youth in the condition it is. Just exactly the way we got now. Racial problems. And youth taking over. And man and sex. Just the way the Roman Empire fell. 1,800 years ago. And here it is right back here again amongst Gentiles. Amen. See? The confusion amongst the religions and things. Oh, what an hour that we're living in. The Lord God has spoke. I believe that. Now let us stand. When He speaks, it's time for us to give reverence. By God's grace, by God's help, I'm more determined than I ever was. Stay with this word. And try my best with the help of God to cut away down to Bethlehem again. Where Bethlehem dwellers can drink from that fountain. How many will join with me with your hands up? Say, I promise to God I'll do it. God bless you. I'll bow your heads just a moment. I believe some brother here, Brother Jeffries, come here. He's going to dismiss the audience while we bow our heads in prayer, if you will.